Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Felix Schuster. I work at MSR um, Cambridge. And this is joint work with my colleagues Olya, Orimenko, Istvan Hala, Manuel Costa, and also with Daniel Gruss from Graz University and Julian Lettner from UC Irvine. Excuse me. Who both did an internship um, with us last summer. Um, yeah. Title of the talk is Efficient Cache Side Channel Protection Using Hardware Transactional Memory. And let me start with, with some motivation. Um, so this is one of the talks that somehow got in despite mentioning SGX. And I'm not sure how that happened. Maybe Dan can explain that. But <laughs> anyway, so our, our, our team is, is, is mostly working on designing and researching um, practical, trustworthy applications for the cloud. And one of the main building blocks that we rely on is, is Intel SGX. And I, I guess most of you um, know what SGX is. So it's, it's an extension to the Intel Instruction Set Architecture. It allows you to dynamically create isolated and attestable containers within any user mode process, essentially. And yeah, it's great. So you can do whatever you want to do inside these containers. And at least abstractly, no one can look into these containers. Um, the problem is, well, this is just an, an abstract promise. So even when you're inside an SGX enclave, um, there are still lots of shared resources with the rest of the system. And as you may know, shared resources always, always, well, almost always mean that there are side channels. Um, so this can be seen as, as the Achilles heel of, of SGX. So sometimes it feels like that for, for every paper that does something useful with SGX, there's at least another paper that, that points out, out, out another, another nasty side channel. So um, when we started this project, we really wanted to, to create some reliable and efficient side channel mitigations for, for SGX enclaves. And it turns out that our solution that we um, came up with is not only applicable to SGX, but at least in its basic form, it can, it can be used to protect against cache side channels in, in general. OK, so let me give you some very brief background, background on, on, on Intel CPU caches. Um, so normally, you have a couple of, of physical cores on, on your CPU. And each core has, has two hyper threads. Um, these hyper threads share an, an L1 data cache and an L1 instruction cache, L1D and L1I. Both are 32K on the recent Skylake -like architecture. Um, below that, there's the L2, which is 256K. And below that, there's the L3, which is shared among all, all physical cores. And that is typically between 4 max, 8 max, sometimes even more. Um, OK, probably not, not new for you. And in our, in our paper, we consider basically two um, Two attacker models. First one is the, the classical one, where, for, for example, in the cloud, you can trust that the, 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 other, the, the other hyper thread that corresponds to the thread you're running your software on is, is not malicious. And in that case, you well, only need to worry about someone eavesdropping on the L3 cache. And in other cases, for example, typically in the, in the S, S, SGX world, um, you cannot really say what is running on the other hyper thread on the same physical core. So you also need to worry about people doing, doing funny things in your L1 or your L2. All right. So let me give you a very brief example of, of a typical um, cache side channel attack. Um, I'm sure this is probably not new for you, um, but just to, just to set the scene. So a uh, common attack is prime probe. And um, here in this example, we have, a, we have a victim on the right side, and we have an attacker on the left side, and they both share an L1 cache. So we, these are two corresponding hyper threads. And the, the victim is running some simple code, an if branch, if else on, on a secret variable, and the attacker wants to learn the secret. Um, so what does he do? Um, in order to, to know what he has to do, we, we, we need to have a very brief understanding of how cache lines map into cache sets in the L1. So um, in the L1, both for L1 instruction cache and L1 data cache, um, we have 64 cache sets. 
every cache set can, can contain or contains eight, eight cache lines, eight ways, and each cache line is 64 bytes, and um, they are um, 64 bytes, yes, and cache lines that are, well, the, the essential information is that cache lines that are 64, that are multiple of four K away from each other, they conflict, they map to the same cache set. All right, so if you, the first 64 bytes of one page always conflict with the first 64 bytes of, of, of another page. That is the uh, essential information here. So um, the attacker wants to learn what the victim is executing here. So he, he primes the L1 instruction cache by executing conflicting code cache lines, and then he invokes the victim. The victim branches depending on the secret variable and, and puts a, well, fetches a code cache line for the else branch. In this case, it's a, it goes to the second cache line, uh, cache set. And now what, what the attacker does in the final probe step, um, the attacker re-executes all the cache lines, measures the execution timing, and in case of, of the way five in, in the second cache set, the execution will take longer, so the attacker knows, okay, the victim evicted my, my, my cache line here, and the attacker learns that um, secret is, is not zero. Uh, is zero, okay. That's a very simple example, and as you probably know, lots of countermeasures have been proposed in uh, the last decade. And, and here's, here, here's a list of typical countermeasures, um, not necessarily complete, but um, what do people usually do? So A, they attempt to attack attacks. Of course, the side channel oftentimes works both, both ways, right? So the, the victim could try to, to measure its own cash access timings and thus try to infer if, if, if there's an attack going on. Then, of course, um, preventing the sharing of resources is also often a reliable and viable approach because if you, if you don't share caches, right, um, there's nothing that can be um, simple. Um, and then there is um, another approach is to, to obfuscate or, or shuffle your memory accesses. Um, and finally, there's um, the, well, um, the approach to make your accesses input independent, and it's often referred to as, as ORAM. Um, unfortunately, um, these, these things are, are often either unreliable, so A, A and C are typically unreliable, or are pretty expensive, up to enormously expensive. So, so B and particularly D are oftentimes very expensive. And our goal is to, um, or was to, create something that is as reliable as possible while being not expensive. Um, okay, so the initial observation of our work is, um, if we could pin sensitive code and data into the caches, then all the problems would go away, essentially, because if the, if the victim can pin, as in the example, um, both the, 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 the code cache lines for the, for the if branch and for the else, else branch into the cache, right, so the attacker can, can, cannot measure anything, the attacker can just learn, okay, both things are in the cache, um, but he doesn't learn which one, which one is touched. Um, and if you have that, then things like prime pro, prime and abort, um, flush reload, flush flush, and so on, they essentially would all go away. Unfortunately, the hardware doesn't allow you to do that at the moment. But fortunately, um, it is indirectly possible using Intel TSX. And there are also more things that we can do using, using TSX. Okay, let me give you a very brief um, run through Intel TSX. Um, Craig already did a great introduction this morning in his Primer Board papers, uh, talk, so I, I think I can, I can just um, keep this quite high level. Um, so TSX gives you th essentially three new instructions, X begin, X end, and X abort. You can use X end to start a transaction. Everything you, you read or write within a transaction is, is kept track of by the CPU, so the CPU maintains a read set and a write set. And if you execute the XN instruction, then everything commits atomically, or if there is a conflict um, coming from a simultaneously running thread, then the transaction aborts, everything is rolled back, cache lines are in invalidated, and so on. Um, or if you execute the X, X abort instruction, then also your, 
transaction collapses and everything is rolled back. And uh, at the bottom of the of the slide, there's a simple example of of, of, an, of an TSX enhanced program. On the left side, you can see um, a program acquire a, a function acquiring a log, then reading a global variable x, writing to a global variable y, and on the right side, you can see the TSX version of that. Here, the the log is um, the log is removed. Instead, we have the x begin instruction, then um, the program optimistically executes the, um, the critical code and then the XN instruction. And if everything goes well, then just can run through without, without the need to acquire a log. And if not, then the, the slow fallback handler um, is executed. And yeah, so the, in this case, the global rival X is the read set and it is all, um, X is also in the right set, and, and Y is also in the right set. Okay, so um, what properties does TSX <coughs> give us precisely that we can use to protect us against side channel attacks? Um, so we, we invested quite some, some time into reverse engineering parts of, of TSX um, with, with different, different low-level experiments, and um, the important results are summarized in the slide. So um, first of all, as we as we heard this morning already, um, the write set is tracked in the L1. So everything that you write is kept in the L1. Um, the read set is, as far as we know, um, limited by the size of the L3, but it's not necessarily tracked in the L3. So we, we have the suspicion that it's tracked a different way, but um, that would go too far for this talk. Um, Anyway, so the, the, the most important aspect here is that whenever something from the right set leaves the L1 cache, your transaction collapses. Whenever something from the read set leaves the L3 cache, your transaction also collapses. Um, now, um, this is great for data, right? We can, I think it's, it's clear how we can use this to, to pin data in, into the caches. The problem is um, for a comprehensive side chain protection, we also want to protect code, right? And unfortunately, there is no such thing as an execution set in TSX. So you can execute an arbitrary number of instructions, um, at, at, at least almost arbitrary number of instructions. And um, hence, it's not, it's not clear how you, immediately clear how you can, can get guarantees for your code. Um, but fortunately, you can, you can put your code into your, your read set thus pinning into the S3. Um, but unfortunately, you cannot be tried hard, but you cannot put into your write set. So um, it's not possible. Well, something, under very rare circumstances, it is apparently possible to write to something in the TSX transaction, then execute it later on. But in, in most cases, this will fail. Um, so there's no, no direct way to pin code into the L1 cache. Um, but fortunately, uh, we discovered an undocumented side effect, which um, is that when you execute a well, code that isn't your L1 instruction cache, if, some, if an external event, like another thread, evicts that, maybe using this, the serial flush instruction, then your transaction also, also collapses. And this lets you, um, by, by executing your code um, and keeping it in the one cache, this lets you sort of with some reliance, um, pin something to the one cache. Um, and finally, um, interrupt and exceptions cause transactional aborts, and everything also works in SGX, which is, which is great. Um, and this leads us to the summary of our, of our cloak approach. So what we do is we pin code and data into the caches. Um, we do, we first, we execute the XBegin instruction, then we preload all sensitive code and data fit into the cache, then we run our sensitive algorithm, and then we finally we commit everything using the X end instruction. Easy, easy enough. And yeah, this way the victim can never experience cache misses, and there's nothing to measure for the attacker. And we can we can on top of that we can use TSX to to make SGX enclave more resilient against a malicious OS. Um, okay, so preloading strategies, um, I, I, I already outlined this a bit. So if we have an L1 attacker, um, we can 
we can pin our all our data into that one cache by doing spurious, spurious write, writes to it in the preloading phase, like fake writes to every cache line. And we can we can um, keep the code in that one by by executing it through the preloading phase, ex executing all possible code cache lines. Um, to protect against an L3 attacker, um, which is weaker, um, um, well, if, if you assume an L3 attacker, we can relax our our protection a bit and thus get a larger working set. So what we do is we preload code into the read set by, by reading code. Then um, we preload read-only read data into the read set by reading it. And then we preload um, writable data by, by writing to it again. All right, how do we how do we preload code through execution? Um, simple trick. We extend the Microsoft C++ compiler to include certain three-byte knob instructions into every code cache line. It's, it's highlighted in orange there. And these knob instructions contain a return instruction, C3. So during, during the preloading phase, we sort of ROP style call these returns. And this way we ping every code cache line without actually ex executing it. Um, here's, um, so for, in case we, for, for the L3 attacker scenario, we um, developed a, an advanced preloading strategy. Um, and, and the reason for this, this is because if you pin something into the L1 cache, right, and then you read large amounts of data through the L3 cache, then this will, if, you, if you're not doing this in a smart way, inevitably evict your L1 cache lines and make your transactions abort prematurely. So what we do is um, we reserve certain cache sets in the L1, depicted on the, on the right, for the right set. And then we allocate all memory accordingly, such that our, our read-only data only lies in the, in, the, in the purple zones, our writable data only lies in the, in the, in the blue zones. And we implemented that in a C++ container library, so it's, it's, it's hidden from the programmer. You, you just say, okay, I, I want to have this um, protected array for reading or for writing, and then um, the thing will take care of allocating everything like this in the, in the one cache. Um, all right. Now, um, of course, we evaluated our approach. Um, first, the, the famous or infamous AST tables. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail here, um, but we had like, like zero overhead, even a bit faster than baseline. I'm not sure why, um, why that was, but um, some previous work has covered already that TSX can sometimes enhance, enhance your performance. Um, so rather small working set, essentially just, just the t-tables. And um, after, well, on the left side, you can see a color matrix where the attacker is monitoring um, cache activity by the victim. And there's, there's a clear signal that for, for certain plain text bytes, certain cache lines are more active than other cache lines. And if we apply our, our countermeasure, then on the right side, you can see there's lots of noise. And we argue that the signal is entirely gone or are mostly gone. Um, similarly, we um, we took an attack from Usenix Security 2015, and we well, this this is an attack where the attacker was inferring keystrokes from another process in the GDK library, and without going too much into detail here, um, on the left side there there is a signal, on the right side there's um, well mostly no signal. Um, yeah, we also well, did standard RSA square and multiply, not too interesting. Um, and lastly, we reported a decision forest classification library in, in SGX. And there, we had rather high overhead. The reason for that is that this, um, this algorithm has a, has a large, large working set. So we have, we have decision trees of like 500 kilobytes that we need to put into our read set. And the larger your, your working set, the higher are the chances that um, your transaction collapses. And so you, you get some overhead from restarting and so on. Um, but if you compare this to our last year's paper, um, where we um, protected the same algorithm using different techniques, there we had up to 62x overhead in a similar setting. So um, I argue that the 248% are maybe not that bad. Um, Okay, so 
just to give you an idea of what a cloak protected algorithm looks like. So this is from the decision forest classification. Um, left is unprotected, right is protected. Essentially, we, we just added a few lines and we annotated the function to be TSX protected and then the, the compiler and the container library take it from there. Um, okay, of course, um, what, what leakage remains? Of course, some leakage remains. Um, first of all, overall execution time, still an issue. Um, and um, next, what we observed is that some, under, under certain conditions, um, in-flight memory accesses are not purged when a transaction aborts. So if you have a, in, in experiments where we had really tightly synchronized attacker and victim, um, we were able to see in-flight memory accesses hitting the caches after the collapse, uh, after the end of a transaction. So we, we were still able to get some signal out of a transaction, and that's, and that's kind of bad. Um, furthermore, um, things like the branch predictor are influenced by code inside a TSX transaction. So if you have a side channel through through these these things, then of course um, that still is a problem. And yeah, other microarchitectural effects. For example, there's there's a um, branch trace buffer, um, stack return buffer, and so on and so on. So um, it's not a, not a silver bullet against all side channels. So um, I said we can we can do more with with TSX, and um, in in the context of the SGX, and I. I need to be quite brief here, um, but you, you'll find more details in the paper. So what we essentially want to have is we want to have a service contract with the operating system. So we, um, A, we always want to have both hyper threads inside the enclave so that we don't need to concern about attackers on the, on the L1. Um, we want to have uh, our private, private cache part, and we don't want to have unexpected interrupts or page faults, and also we don't want to be reset um, all the time. And Here's just one trick that we use to, um, to check the honesty of the operating system here. And the other tricks are on the paper. Um, and this relates to what, what Craig presented this morning. So we, we sort of exploiting um, the same side channel here. So we, what, what, what we want to have is we want to have both hyper threads of one core inside the enclave, right? But there's no way to check that directly. So what we do is we, we use this covered channel that is introduced by TSX in order to detect if two threads are indeed sharing an L1. And wh what we do here is, one, well, the threads choose a secret number inside the enclave using the RDU instruction, and then they transmit this number over the L1 cache using the TSX side channel that Craig described this morning. And this way you can figure out if two threads are indeed sharing an L1. And yeah, this is, this is one of three, three tricks that we that we use to, to check that the OS is honoring our, our contract. Um, yep, that leads me to my last slide. Conclusion is um, Intel TXX can efficiently mitigate side channels. Um, it can be particularly useful inside, inside SGX because it can not only be used to, to address the cache side channel issue but also other, other issues. Um, Problematic is that um, conceptually you're, you're limited to the L1 and the L3, right? So everything that, that you want to write needs to fit into the L1. Everything that you, you're potentially going to read, for example, your decision forest um, needs to fit into the L3. And even then, you, you need to make sure that everything well, fits nicely, you, you don't have self-eviction and so on. So it, it can get quite messy for the programmer. If, if he's not doing what knows, if he doesn't know what he's doing precisely, and yeah, and some leakage remains. So there, as I said, there's there are still many other microarchitectural buffers and structures that that can leak. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for questions. All right. Anybody got questions? No, I thought you were going to leave on a po on a positive note, but the, the remaining leakage <laughs> makes me a little sad. Uh, Felix, thanks for the talk. Um, 
You mentioned that your protected AES is about the same performance of two measurement error than the yeah. unprotected AES. But uh, what about preloading? You don't preload every time you do unprotected AES, and that's a lot um, of memory accesses. That's true. So um, that, that's a very, very good point. So in that case, the preloading doesn't, doesn't matter much because um, um, I think most of the data we're going to touch it anyway, and it's just I think the, the working set is, is just 4K. So um, we're, just, we're just fetching a couple of, of cache lines there. And um, we are not restarting. So I think we are not restarting often because we everything fits into the L1, so we, there isn't a really an issue with the boards. And I'm not quite sure, but it could also be that we did some batching there, that we first do the preloading and then we, um, we use the, um, the data that, that, that we have in the caches and, and the multiple runs of the algorithm. Any other questions? All right, I have some questions, I guess, if you guys don't. Uh, probably asked you this, but I forget the answer. Uh, so if you, you have containers for helping you uh, lay things out in memory uh, data-wise, but code-wise, it seems like you have a compiler that's going to structure things and add the knobs. Yeah. Um, how does this work, I guess? Like, what, what if my code doesn't fit? Does it still try, and then I just find out when I run it? Um, so ideally, the compiler would tell you, right? but currently, it just, it just takes all your code and tries to to get it into the L1. Um, I mean, 32K of code is quite a lot, so um, I think if you if you have 32K of code, then probably things will fail elsewhere earlier. Um, but there, there might be other people on the machine. Um, yes. So you, um, you, you're saying that there could be cache activity that evicts your, your cache lines? Sure, yes, so that's an issue. So the, the more load you have on the machine, um, the more fragile everything, everything becomes, and then things collapse earlier, yeah. Do, do you yeah. have an intuition for when that happens? I guess, like, if, if in a cloud architecture? So our, our, our thinking is, um, I, I hinted at that with, the, with, with US contract. So we, ideally, we want to be able to, to say, OK, now for the, for, for the next 10 seconds, it's just going to be me inside this enclave doing my thing, and um, I don't want to be interrupted. And then you could potentially use, well, the US could then use like Intel CAT, cache allocation technology, to provide you with a, with a, with a private part of the cache. And, but, but then the issue is inside the enclave, you have no way to check, no direct way to check if, if, if you're really in a private cache. So you could then use the, the thing to, to be sure that the US is, is giving you what, what you asked for. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yes, maybe we should be rethinking hardware a little bit. Uh, let's right. thank him again.